Good. So I start with you. So it's really, a, a, I think I can say this justifiably. So it's really a different approach to uh, symptoms. And the main idea is really linking brain and symptoms, which we really don't know yet in psychiatry. In other fields of medicine, we know we know that, for instance, the pancreas and insulin and glucose are related to the various diabetic symptoms all over the body. But we don't know that connection in the case of the psychiatric symptoms. So what I present you is sort of an overlap, or a brief overview, uh, first about sort of the crisis of psychiatry. There's a lot of discussion in recent uh, journals and authors as a crisis of psychiatry. It's main, mainly a translational crisis from science to clinic, and that's really manifest that we don't have any biomarkers, let alone therapeutic monitoring markers. Then my answer to that crisis of psychiatry is, some of you already know the spatial temporal approach. Then I give you two examples of that, and that's really a new view. For some of you, it might be confusing what uh, Nortov tells you here, because it's a deeper dimension of psychiatric disorders, which is usually neglected. And that's here, so I consider depression as a speed disturbance and schizophrenia as a temporal precision disturbance. So I will go into some detail, present you various lines of data and uh, clinical reports which really support such a view. And then I briefly come to the conclusions about what are potential mechanisms, how that affects diagnosis and therapy. And this is uh, just for you to know, this is really work in progress. Um, and there's various lines tying together. So first, what do I mean by crisis of psychiatry? Uh, you all know that uh, mental disorders are increasing in prevalence. 80% of all mental disorders are anxiety, depression. And here in Canada, probably in Turkey too, you meet an amazing amount of people in daily life who have a psychiatric history. I remember once we were here in the front page of the Ottawa Citizen last year, and even the cashier, then I bought the newspaper in the evening because I wanted to have it by myself. And then she looked at the newspaper picture, looked at my face and said, yeah, is this you? I said, yes. I said, I need you. She said, I need you. I have anxiety too. So just a simple cashier, it, it, it's incredible. So I encounter it everywhere and I'm sure you too. So you all know this, your psychiatrist treatment is based on more or less subjective behavioral observations. Um, one key problem for me with the drugs, of course, I know that we need the drugs, is that it is just like symptom suppression. You, It's like a plaster on the wound, but the plaster doesn't stop the bleeding, uh, the source of the bleeding. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a real problem for me. Uh, trial and error treatments, you all know this, you try this serotonergic drug, this uh, for another one, then this doesn't work. Of course, I know they're all guidelines, but ultimately it's more or less the same. Uh, suffering, I don't need to tell you, you all know this. Um, and for me, being also a basic scientist, is really that we do not have, let me put this to the side, I don't know whether you see the title, um, i push you here, well, that really the, the brain mechanism, as I said, in the case of diabetes, we know the, uh, the link from the pancreas through the insulin and glucose to the symptoms. Now, imagine if you weren't knowing this, if you then you would be just confronted with the various diabetic symptoms and you would see symptoms at the toe you would symptoms in the eyes symptoms in the stomach and you say these are different disorders because these are completely different organs but then aha it's glucose aha and then you know that glucose is modulated by insulin and then you can put everything together and we are really facing an analogous heterogeneity of symptoms in psychiatry we see affective symptoms, cognitive symptoms, motor symptoms, perceptual symptoms, uh, somatic symptoms, vegetative symptoms, social change, and they usually co-occur. Even in depression, it's not just a mood disorder. Yeah, it's much more, it's a cognition disorder. I will show you perception is abnormal, psychomotor retardation, you know, it's a very strong clinical marker for depression and for the uh, success of the treatment. So we don't really know how all these different symptoms which usually co-occur in different balances are related to an underlying disturbance. So we don't really know the link from the insulin through the glucose to the symptoms. The insulin and the glucose are really missing in our case. We just have this enormous heterogeneity of symptoms. We have the overlap of symptoms even between different disorders, anxiety and schizophrenia and depression 
anxiety disorder, PTSD, and, and so forth. I could go on for hours, uh, you don't want it. Yeah, so, and we really don't know this link. Um, as I said, already mentioned, when you enter cardiology, they ask for the symptoms, they do a lab uh, testing, you get a lab report with the probability of the different enzymes, uh, probability for certain disorders, then you get an ultrasound, you get other diagnosis. So you get a battery of different kinds of tests. You probably also get a behavioral test when you put you on a, on a running uh, EKG and, uh, test EKG and things like that. None of that available in psychiatry. So we uh, just submitted a paper on this uh, crisis of psychiatry. For me, it's twofold. It's very important. So first, it's a crisis of mechanism. As I said, we don't really understand the neuronal, neurosocial, neuroecological mechanisms leading to the psychopathological symptom. That's what I said on the left. And that's why we don't have biomarkers for the diagnosis, let alone for differential diagnosis. The other thing, it's also a crisis of subjectivity. Because for me, the key of psychiatric symptoms is an intrinsic subjectivity. It's a meaning. It is the meaning I attribute to the voice I hear in my head. And then the doctor calls this auditory hallucination. But what makes me suffering and what makes me anxious is the, exper is the experience, the meaning I attribute to that voice. These are first person perspective symptoms. And if one thing biological psychiatry has shown over the last 20 years, if you have a pure third person approach, you don't get to biomarkers. Yeah, many biological colleagues might not want to hear this. But then you have the other extreme. You have what is called phenomenological psychopathology. For instance, Josef Panas in, in Denmark and other people, Louis Saas, they emphasize the first person, ex, person uh, experience, first person perspective, and I agree with that. However, they don't go to the brain which you can only observe in third person perspective. So what you really need to link, you need, the need to link the mechanism to the subjectivity. And that is basically, you will see this, my spatial temporal approach about. And I think this is a sort of a graphic representation what we really miss. We don't really know the connection between the symptoms to the brain and your first, first person experience slash the mental or the mind, if you say, in more colloquial terms. And that I really look here for what is called the comical. So that's basically the background against which uh, my spatial temporal approach is set. So that's why I come to this one now. So how do I address? So here, uh, and you, I'll show you an example that I think we can really say that we're on the uh, way to really identifying some of these biomarkers. I will provide you support for that. Uh, um, idea in very coarse terms, uh, the specific spatial temporal patterns in the brain. And you uh, saw that, for instance, in Kant's paper that he analyzed certain topographic pattern and of the self, and you see they predicted the emotion dysregulation. So, and of course, another key factor is the dynamics, electrical waves, uh, you all know this. And I often like to compare, Khan already knows this, and you probably know this from my last visit. I like to compare basically uh, the brain's fluctuations to waves. Uh, you go to the seaside in Izmir, you see big waves, you see small waves. Uh, they have different power. The smaller waves have less power. The uh, larger waves have much more power. So when you're a surfer, you like the big waves. And that's exactly what you see here, lower right, also in the brain. And these waves are key because the assumption is that these waves of your brain translate into corresponding mental waves. I will give you examples later, for instance, in depression, where these waves are too slow and with drastic consequences. Then we can measure these kind of waves, this dynamics, the topography, and you will see we develop on different levels. We can measure it in psychological tests, in behavioral tests, then also in EEG, and also in fMRI. And you will see examples of these different layers of potential bio, uh, biomarkers in the examples. So this is exactly like in physical medicine. 
you do exactly the same. You have a lab report, you have an ultrasound, you have an X-ray, you have an MRI, all of your heart. Because it gives you different dimensions, different features of the heart. And then you put all those findings together and then you made a diagnosis. That's exactly what I envision here for spatial temporal psychopathology. So uh, um, I think it's clear. So space-time dynamic provides the common currency that what is shared between brain experience and symptoms. And now you say, what on earth does not of mean by space and time? I will provide you more examples in the following uh, in the different disorders. And what is important, I consider psychotic disorders as space-time disorders. So in the same way that, again, you know my example of diabetes, <clears throat> uh, it's a pancreas disorder, it's an insulin disorder. Here it's really the space-time, how the brain constructs its own inner time and space is in an abnormal way. And I will, as I, for instance, the waves. I will give more examples. And these waves, you can observe them in the brain, you can preserve, observe them in the symptoms, and you can observe them in your experience. And now I think it's time for me to provide some flesh to the bones, but that's sort of the background. Um, historically, this approach, of course, as you know, you see here, I'm from Germany. Germany has a long tradition of psychopathology, so this is where I'm coming from. So many ideas are coming from there and also from Poland, neuroscience. So now let me give you more concrete examples. Uh, for instance, here, depression. So depression is for me a speed disturbance. When you just observe a clinically a uh, clinically very severe depressed patient, psychomotor retardation, of course, the first thing you see, patient does move, move very slow. Uh, the shoulders are hanging, yeah, and the head is like this and can, cannot get up in the morning. Typical syndrome, you immediately see, you see the facial muscle, psychomotor retardation. Then the speech might be very slow and monotonous, so not the way I speak now. So. That also really tells you, okay, maybe the speech is also too slow. So that's, uh, you all know this, of course, the self and its dark, uh, reality are dark, isolated without any hope in future, tortured by the own thoughts and rumination. So now the question, what is the basic disturbance underlying all these symptoms? So the concept of basic disturbance goes back to an earlier French psychiatrist, uh, Minkowski, um, 19th, 20th century, very clever guy in schizophrenia, he spoke of a basic disturbance or a generative disturbance. So a disturbance which basically generates the various symptoms. So again, in diabetes, the generative or basic disturbance is the insulin. In the case of, uh, case of myocardial infarction, <clears throat> the basic disturbance or generative disturbance which generates all the symptoms is obviously the blockade in the coronary arteries and so forth. Yeah, so what I'm looking for here is not, and that's very important, not the neural or psychological correlate of each of the symptoms. What I'm looking for is much more ambitious, and you can call me manic, uh, is what is the underlying basic disturbance which generates all the symptoms. So I'm not looking for each of the symptoms, the correlate of the diabetes symptoms in the foot, in the retina, in the stomach, what I'm looking for, what underlies? I'm looking for the insulin of depression. Um, and that's what I mean by basic disturbance, underlying all the symptoms. And the basic disturbance assumption is the speed of the brain and mind are too slow. And now I show you some example how this is manifest in different symptom domains. So, the first symptom domain is visual perception. You might be surprised that I say, come on, depression is about cognition, it's about mood, it's not about visual. Ask the patients, particularly in the early stages. They feel isolated from their reality. They cannot follow the outside speed because it's too fast for them. I had a patient who became mutistic because he came, she was completely mute because she told me I cannot follow my mom's speech because she's simply speaking too fast. The mom's speech was very normal. But for her, for the patients, it was too fast, relative to her own slow inner speed. So in here, I show you a couple of investigations which we did. Um, so here we presented uh, that the perception is too static. So how can you measure that? So this is 
what to call it's the grating and that moves this is moving uh, and then you need to decide in which direction it moves and then when you actually perceive it you perceive it a little blurry uh, that's the way you can perceive it and you can reconstruct that from psychophysical data yeah so i don't want to go into detail but you can basically reconstruct how people perceive this moving thing how they actually perceive it based on the data when they judge it moves and in which direction it moves. so that's basically what you can really reconstruct so now we present this in a slow and in a fast version and what we observe in the depression that here is the healthy subject they perceive it like this so you can see it's quite different from the original why because it becomes blurry it moves and you perceive the move you go with the move so it becomes blurry you cannot distinguish the details anymore because it's it's like a moving car yeah when i look here out of the window and i follow the car things become blurry it's very normal so and you can calculate a certain motion distance from the original in these uh, gray pixel values of these guys you can basically calculate the gray pixel values and then you basically see the difference between what is perceived and the original and in the healthy subject this is quite remarkable whereas in the depressed patients you don't see much difference so maybe they perceive things more static yeah so here we uh, uh, compared that to a um, distorted clock because it's too slow so you don't perceive the dynamic so now imagine if you cannot follow the speed of my speech because it's too fast for you because you're too slow so of course you will be strong you will become frustrated says it's not of talks too fast i don't want to listen to him and then you withdraw and then you're frustrated very normal yeah and we also correlated that uh with uh back depression inventory and that's exactly uh what we saw so now you say maybe how about on the neuronal level so this is a behavior test which indeed we want to now use also for diag differential diagnostic because we did the same in schizophrenia and you don't see this kind of deficit you see in schizophrenia a different deficit now we did the same uh probing the brain so if our assumption is right you would assume that in visual cortex the neuronal activity is too slow meaning it does not react to fast stimuli so here we presented slow and fast uh, visual stimuli a checkerboard typical uh, stimulus for checkerboard and we presented them in a slow and fast so here we did this first we looked for the uh, typical visual cortex region this is the middle temporal gyrus is a visual cortex area v5 details don't matter is part of the visual cortex region and this region has been shown to be particularly involved in this kind of task that's uh, basic knowledge and now then we compare different four different kinds of frequencies in the external visual stimuli uh, slow very slow slow fast very fast and here you see uh, here we plotted the two slower ones and the two faster ones together and you can see here the uh, white ones are the healthy subjects the blue ones are the uh, major depressives these were inpatients uh, severely depressed uh, BDI uh, at least larger than 20 um, <clears throat> and you can see in the slow they showed the same degree of activity in this uh, visual region however in the fast stimuli you see they don't show much activity change the uh, healthy subject show much more activity change here in the white one whereas the depressed don't then you see interestingly the same also in the uh, higher order regions the cortical midline structures as we call them you can see i hope you can see this i don't know what you see you see the uh, depressed patients don't make a difference between fast and slow stimuli yeah whereas the healthy can so we can differentiate between a slow and a fast driving car the depressed patient is not able to because his visual cortex doesn't react she or he doesn't perceive that yeah so everything is too slow now ask your patients what they perceive that's exactly what they report you everything stands still is too slow yeah for them in their perception yeah their perception of the outer world as well as their perception of their own inner world yeah 
So, and that imagine if everything is too slow, of course you become depressed. It's a logical consequence. So then that has huge implications that now we are also, we already did one pilot study on uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation in visual cortex. Yeah, and we showed the same therapeutic efficacy as in trans, uh, TMS of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So now the clinical idea is to really select the patients, those patients who have strong visual perceptual deficits in the psychophysics task, in the fMRI visual cortex, that those patients receive TMS for visual cortex. Whereas patients who show strong psychomotor retardation might more benefit from TMS in motor cortex. And we did a pilot study on TMS in motor cortex and were again showed very good efficacy rates. For patients who showed deficits in working memory, which is associated with dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, there's a current TMS might be the right thing to do. So now you say, yes, not of this is just visual perception, but the real thing in depression are thoughts and emotions. So we're currently conducting a study on the dynamics of emotions. And I can show you already some results on the dynamics of thought. So here, how can you measure thought dynamics? So you ask patients to continuously indicate when their thought content changes. So you instruct them to say, when does your thought content change? And is your thought content more internally oriented about your own self, or is it more externally oriented about the environment? And about the latter, as clinicians, you have already a clear hypothesis. In depression, you expect that they have more internally oriented thoughts about their own self. And that's exactly what we observed. And what we also could do here is that we say, okay, according to the pattern of change, we could calculate the frequency, dynamics. We could see how often, what is the frequency of their thought change? Yeah, and that's what is plotted here. And in depression, so we had a time series of thought content changes subjectively indicated by the patient. And we could say, and that converted into a time series. And then we can do all the kinds of analysis with the psychological time series as we do with the brain time series. So here we, for instance, calculated the frequency. And you see that the frequency of thought content change is much less in MDD uh, major depressive disorder than in depressed bipolar. And there were some other features, which I don't mention here, which were shared. Uh, so this distinguishes MDD from bipolar, but we had some other features where bipolar and MDD shared different from health subject. So that also suggests a differential diagnostic value. So here I show you the thought curves uh, of some typical subjects. So this is a healthy subject. This is basically how often your thought content changes. And here is also plotted the degree of awareness. So how much aware are you of your thoughts? And you see they're quite aware. Here in depressed subject, you see not much thought content. The curve is completely flat. Here in bipolar is sort of like the MDD, but not as extreme. So we're currently running another study where we're really trying whether this is differential diagnostic uh, relevant. So this could be another task, which we're intending to use, we also do this now in schizophrenia and anxiety patients for differential diagnostic on a purely psychological behavior level. Yet another symptom of depression, you know, it's this ruminations. It's all about the old self. I'm guilty. I'm not worth living as, and so on and so forth. So it's a very self-centric, uh, increased self-focus as we described and abnormally slow topography and brain and mind. So here we did one study where we uh, investigated, this was done by Andreas Calabrini in Italy, uh, the overall topography of the brain. And what we see, it's really shifted from the sensory regions to the higher order regions like the default mode. So it is less, the topography is less focused on input processing, sensory regions and output regions, motor cortex, but much much more on higher order regions like the fault mode network, which are associated with your own sense of self. That's why you probably have this increased self-focus. And here on the upper right, we also saw that the DMN, the default mode,
mode network default mode, which is very powerful. And this was a small sample size, 50 subjects. You got quite a high prediction in the machine learning model, 90% accuracy. Then we said, how is this related to the speed? So then again, oops, sorry. Uh, we tested here uh, next. Presented them in a file and you see in the MDD than in the healthy. And here on the right, you can see that that also correlated with the degree of psychomotor retardations, meaning the less the regions of the motor cortex and the default mode network regions reacted to fast stimuli, the higher the degree of psychomotor retardation in the symptoms. So, here, from my point of view, it's a beautiful example how neuronal slowness translates into behavior slowness, yeah? Common currency, yeah? And that's why we also, uh, that was one of the reasons why we induced this pilot study on TMS and motor cortex, which we are about to put together uh, in a publication. So then here you can already see, as I said, indi indicated earlier, a clear individualization of your TMS target according to the predominant symptom pattern and the corresponding neuronal changes in either visual or, for instance, uh, motor cortex. So um, then, of course, then how do the emotions fit in? And of course, Khan knows this very well because he did this very nice investigation. Um, I probably don't have to say much because I'm sure he already explained it. It's very well done. You see sort of uh, different layers of the cells an interceptive layer, exoceptive mental layer. These are different regions in the brain. So it's a three layer topography of the self, your body self, your environmental self, and your mental self. And you can see in depression, particularly here, the red ones are the depression. You can see abnormally increased activity in the exoceptive self and also in the mental self. And you can see here, the three layers of self in the healthy subject are more equal, but they're completely disbalanced in the depression, which particularly the mental and exoceptors are abnormally high. So your brain topography of yourself changes, and that leads also that your mental self is extremely overemphasized. Yeah, and that's what you see in this increased self-focus and the ruminations. So then here, Khan did a very, very clever statistical model here uh, for predicting and that was uh, the nice data you acquired over there in Turkey with the emotional attention task. And <clears throat> uh, in post-acute depressed patients, so these are really trait features. These are not state features, but you know all that much better than I do. And you can really see that that also predicts, I don't want to go into detail here, that that really predicts these uh, changes in the topography of your global brain activity related to the self really predicts your emotion dysregulation, your emotion attention. So putting it all together, depression for me is a speed disturbance of abnormal slowness. So it's clear. And this too slow activity is a basic disturbance and it's manifest in movements, perception, emotion, cognition, self, and the brain. So you can have a battery of tests, psychological, behavioral, neuronal testing for speed disturbance. Now you say, come on, speed, the experience of decreased speed might be just a consequence of the symptoms. It doesn't generate the symptoms. That of course would be a, a serious uh, blow to my assumption that speed is a basic disturbance. Now the question, how can you test that? Here, I give you one example how we tested that. So here we, uh, and you see time of assessment. So here we investigated patients, uh, a sample of 100 depressed patients, uh, pure psychologically, with uh, the childhood traumatic questionnaire, basically for early life events, traumatic life events. We also investigated time perception. There's a um, time perception uh, questionnaire, Zimbardo, um, a time perspective inventory. 
and we investigated depressive symptoms with the VDI back depression inventory. So now the question is, if the time perspective changes on the psychological level are just a consequence of the symptoms, then you would expect such a model. You would expect that the childhood trauma causes the depressive symptoms and that in turn causes the time perspective changes. The other way, if time perspective is a basic disturbance, then the time perspective should mediate the link between childhood trauma and depressive symptoms, this model. So this is what you call in statistics mediation model. And then you can do various kinds of operations, compare the different variables with or without the mediator. And what really turned out that this model explains the data the best. So you can have childhood trauma, but maybe your brain has no predisposition to changes in its temporal structure and the time perspective. And then you will not de develop depression. However, another person might be more vulnerable to time changes following childhood trauma, time perception changes, and then you develop depressive symptoms. So we consider that as, of course, as the first tentative support that really the time changes also on the psychological level are basic disturbance, yeah? Generating the various symptoms. So that's basically the idea. Speed disturbance is a basic or generative disturbance. It drives the generation of the symptoms, just like <clears throat> insulin uh, drives glucose and diabetes. And uh, here on the right, you can see here, behavioral psychological, various behavioral psychological neural markers of slow speed in depression and how they in turn shape emotion, uh, cognition, visual perception, motor, etc. Uh, symptoms. That's sort of the idea. And I will, uh, towards the end of my talk, I will really show that that I have a high potential of serving as differential diagnostic mark. Now, give you another example, schizophrenia. So schizophrenia, you might be surprised by that, is for us a temporal precision disturbance. So, of course, you know schizophrenia as a heterogeneity of symptoms, clinical presentation, huge inter-individual differences. The self and the reality are split, decoupled from each other, resulting in fragment, fragmentation of both self and world. And then you develop positive symptoms, delusions, hallucination, disorganized speech, negative symptoms. You know all that. I don't need to tell you any of that. So what is the basic disturbance underlying all this? For us, it's the neural and the mental activity of brain and mind suffer from temporal imprecision. And when I talk about temporal imprecision, I mean temporal imprecision in the millisecond range. And I will show you data supporting. So the temporal windows, the first line of support, that the temporal windows of the brain are too long. So our brain has like, uh, I know you can't see my office now, but I have various uh, window sizes here in my office. And through each of the window sizes, you see slightly different things. The larger windows are sort of more zoom out, it's more abstract what you see. The smaller window sizes is more concrete, more fine grade detail. Same with the brain. If you have longer temporal windows, you become more abstract, you see less of the details. If you have smaller temporal windows, you see more concrete, more details, but you're missing the whole picture. So in what we observed, and I show you these data now in depression, uh, that we observe that the temporal windows, you can measure them by what is called the autocorrelation function, are too long. So this is what we did here in this uh, study. This is uh, done uh, uh, together with uh, Josef Panas and, and Kai-Erik Sandstein, as the postdoc from, from Denmark. And you will see we had also the nice opportunity to evaluate the self in terms of the experience uh, E-scale, the phenomenology scale. So what we tested here, so basically, if you don't see the details, your temporal windows may be too long and you integrate too much, yeah? So and you see less details and become more abstract. So, and you can test this. So here's a particular uh, a test for that, sort of a self other morphing test. This goes over 15 seconds. You uh, you start with your own face, as you can uh, see, it's not me, uh, and it morphs into another person's face, yeah? And then you have to click at what at which point your own self is no longer there and it morphs into another face. And it's usually somewhere in the middle. And then of course the other way around. 
So that really tests if you have too much temporal integration, you integrate all this and you say, okay, maybe my self is only lost here. Yeah. Whereas if you have very smaller windows, you already say here, maybe here, this is no longer myself because you don't integrate this one with this one. So what we observe in schizophrenia, this is done in EEG and you can measure this temporal integration segregation through uh, what is called the autocorrelation window. And you could see that here in uh, schizophrenia, uh, here, the red line are the schizophrenic, the blue line are the healthy subject, you see a clearly longer uh, temporal integration window slash autocorrelation window. And that was doing task. Yeah, and you can see here the uh, topo maps, you can see this here. And there's another study which we just uh, got accepted for publication, which really replicated these findings. So then the interesting thing is, how do you link that to the symptoms? So as I said, we were very lucky here, uh, together with the Denmark group around uh, Panas, that we could really had patients here uh, who also, in addition to the EEG and this task, also got the ease with the experience uh, of anonymous uh, self symptoms. And we could measure, basically measure what they call the basic self disturbance. Yeah. So, and what we observed that the relationship between this was a moderation model for the statistics uh, fans among you, uh, that we could link the basic self disorder directly to the general or negative symptoms measured with the puns through the intrinsic timescales. So if your timescale is too long, you really had a transformation of this into negative symptoms. So that really tells you that the temple changes are key for transforming a normal psychological process into an abnormal, yeah? So it's basically like an abnormal spatial or temple envelope here uh, around your cognitive functions or your self function, which then elicits these abnormal symptoms. So we speak here, it's really uh, temple integration. We measured the temple integration on the neuronal level with the autocorrelation window. We measured the temple integration here with this task, with the self morphing task I showed you before. And we measure temporal integration on the level of the symptoms with the positive and negative symptoms. Yeah. So um, that's one feature that we say maybe they simply unsharp, they integrate too much input, and then they cannot distinguish uh, the different inputs and the different events. And that's, I think, exactly what you see in these patients. One key feature, and I don't need to tell you that, is the confusion of internal and external reality. Um, delusions, yeah? You confuse that something what happens inside, you project it upon the outside world. Hallucinations, there's an internal change in your brain, an inner voice, but you associate it with the external reality. So for me, it's always the question, how is it possible that you confuse internal external reality? So the idea is here that maybe this underlies uh, no proper temple and neural distinction. So show you this one. So this was a, a meta-analysis of various EEG studies, also some fMRI studies, where we looked how schizophrenic subjects distinguish their task-evoked activity in response to external input from the internally ongoing on pre-stimulus activity. So your pre-stimulus activity or resting state activity is associated with internally oriented cognition. Yeah, about your own self, about your wishes, about your fantasies and so on and so forth. Mind wandering, it's often called. Yeah, whereas your external task, your stimuli, when you listen to me, I hope you have some externally oriented cognition focusing on spatial temporal psychopathology and schizophrenia. But maybe you just think about your girlfriend and you just let north of talk. So then you're more here. So now, now we investigated in the schizophrenia subject, how much on the purely neuronal level, mainly in EEG, this activity distinguished from the pre-stimulus and the resting state activity. Because we took that as a proxy for the distinction between internally oriented cognition and externally oriented cognition. So, and the data are here. So what we observe, I know this is a complex figure, so that's why I try to explain it uh, simple, that basically that the schizophrenia patients showed not much difference between the task evoked activity and the pre-stimulus or resting state activity. You see the red stuff. 
the healthy subject showed a clear distinction. The difference between task and rest was much higher, much larger than in the health and the schizophrenic subject. So what does this mean? That the schizophrenic patients, when they get an external stimulus, the activity elicited by that basically does not distinguish much from the ongoing activity. Consequence? Of course, you perceive then what's the external stimulus like an internal uh, thing. So you confuse internal and externally oriented cognition. Next thing. One thing typically for schizophrenia is, you know, they don't align or synchronize with their environment. When you have schizophrenic patients trying to dance to music, they cannot synchronize with the music. Look, observe it in music therapy. I'm a big fan of music therapy. The schizophrenic patients is standing there and is lost. They cannot synchronize. They cannot automatically, it's because completely unconscious, they will not tap their foot with their rhythm, or if they do, they do it in a non-rhythmic way. Timing relative to the timing of external stimuli. And I show you here some uh, recent EED, EEG data uh, published last year by our group. It's really to emphasize. So here we show that in the EEG doing uh, in response to external stimuli, that the amplitude in EEG, event-related potential, that the amplitude is temporally imprecise. It's either too late or too early, and it is a show high intrasubject variability across the different trials. That's what you can see here. Oh, where's my cursor? I don't know, I somehow lost it. Yeah, here. Uh, you can see here, these are the schizophrenic subjects. These are the healthy subject, and you see in the SETA and in the alpha band in EEG, you see much higher delays in your uh, amplitude of your evoked potentials in the uh, schizophrenia patients. Um, so now I lost the cursor again. Okay. Um, yeah. And so that's what you see here. So that the amplitude is delayed, and meaning the stimulus does not elicit proper activity changes in the brain relative to the ongoing activity. And that means that you do not really perceive the external stimulus as distinct from the ongoing uh, cognitions you have. Yeah, so basically the external stimulus becomes part of your internal cognition and is not distinguished as an external event. So of course you confuse environment and internal ongoing. No, so here we did another thing. It's basically here we did a typical uh, auditory oddball paradigm. Um, it's a very nice study. And what you usually see here, you can see this in the healthy subject, that you see that your face, your ongoing face cycles, they show a certain concentration in a certain face angle along the onset of the external stimulus. That's what you can measure here, what is called intertrial face coherence. And you can see this here, the red angle. So it's a certain, it's basically you have a certain rhythm uh, like a ex, uh, music piece and your brain basically shows the same rhythm as the music piece in its ongoing activity because the brain aligns or synchronizes with the external environment. And that's basically when you tap with your feet to the ongoing rhythm of the music. However, you see in schizophrenia is black, completely blank. There's nothing, there's no concentration, there's no rhythm in the brain following the rhythm of the external stimulus. Yeah, so, and that's why I say, when you see schizophrenic patients, they cannot tap or move to the music in a rhythmic way because they lost that ability because there's a temple imprecision in the millisecond. We are talking here about millisecond ranges because it's an alpha and theta um, uh, in the face, yeah? Um, so, and these data are confirmed by our, our other, by other investigations of ours, as well as by other investigators. And I don't show that here. In depression, you see, you do not see these differences. In depression or bipolar, you see a similar picture like here, meaning this again has differential diagnostic value. So then you say, okay, how is that temple imprecision in your neuronal activity manifest in the mind? So that's where we investigated the pure subjective experience, temple fragmentation. And here we developed a scale, um, we developed a scale for the uh, experience of temple fragmentation. 
and various other temples that goes back to phenomenological psychopathology, but we investigated a quantitative scale, observer-based, but we also now develop a self-rating scale for that. And you can see, and so these are uh, schizophrenic patients, uh, bipolar affective patients, healthy subjects, and you can see this is very specific. This is the item of how do you experience temple fragmentation. This is, for instance, very specific for the schizophrenic as distinguished from the other two groups. You see some other items. This is, for instance, abnormal slowness. You perceive there's no difference between affective and schizophrenic patients. So again, we see here a subjective time experience, temporal fragmentation. We also have the uh, space scale. That's why it's called uh, scale for uh, time space experience in uh, psychosis uh, published last year. And we can see again, uh, it has a differential diagnostic value. That's important. So that's why we want to use it now. We also develop a, a scale for time space experience in depression and anxiety, also in trauma. So last thing, how is it, for instance, temporal and precision in, in behavior? So this is a very interesting thing, which a, a former student of mine in Taiwan did. He was very interesting in drawing and painting and using that for psychiatry. We said, OK, uh, let's try if the schizophrenic patients are really temporally imprecise, then their drawing process, how they draw things, should also be temporally imprecise. And we could measure that, which again, we see autocorrelation window. You can see, for instance, here, uh, we let them paint different kinds of paintings, uh, drawings, and then you, we measured the drawing process, the autocorrelation of the drawing process. And you could see, again, it's much more fragmented and disrupted in the schizophrenia patients. Now, putting it all together, and then I'm close to the end, uh, temporal imprecision of Brain mind is the basic disturbance of schizophrenia. And I think here the paper by Anne Marie Wolf from my group last year, it's in the timing. I think it's a very nice way. And there's more and more increasing support also from other groups uh, for this. Um, important temporal, and that really also leads you. So it's really hardcore neuroscience and hardcore psychology what we do, but it leads you back to the early phenomenology. And one brilliant, I can only highly recommend reading him, uh, Eugene Minkowski, the uh, French psychiatrist, uh, 19th, 20th century. He spoke of a loss of vital dynamic, of vital contact with reality as basic disturbance of schizophrenia. So he's the one to whom the concept of basic disturbance or generative disturbance goes back to. And we, I added the vital dynamic because you don't have change. You have temporal imprecision that interrupts the ongoing flow. So your dynamic becomes sort of static. Yeah, so the assumption is what he called loss of vital contact with reality is mediated by temporal imprecision in brain and mind. And that in turn le uh, leads to the various kinds of symptoms. So conclusion, uh, uh, three slides, uh, mechanisms. So we say that spatial temporal psychopathology uh, space and time are analogously disturbed on the neuronal level and in the symptoms. So that's why we speak of a neural topography of a mental topography. Mental topography, the relationship between your emotions, between your cognitions, between your movements is abnormal. For instance, it's too slow in depression. And that at the same time leads us to topographic or dynamic disturbances in the brain. So for people who work with me, they know that I constantly switch back and forth between experience. What do the patients tell you about their spatial experience? What do they tell? And that means, aha, that and that kind of spatial changes, how might that be manifest in corresponding topographic changes in the brain or vice versa? Yeah, so that's why we developed the space and time scales for the experience and also various topographic and neuronal measures on the brain side. Yeah, and so that links really the first person experience with what we described here. This is a paper to be submitted, deep phenotyping approach. Deep, because we're talking about a deeper layer underlying this, the various symptoms. Yeah, we are not talking just about glucose or the different changes when you have your uh, retina abnormal or your big toe abnormal in diabetes, but we are talking about the insulin and the pancreas. Yeah, and that for me provides a link between the neuronal and the mental level through the shared topography and dynamic. That's the scientific side of things. That's the clinical thing. Don't read the whole thing. We just wanted to indicate 
that the various forms of experience, subjective experience here, space and time experience, are quite different between schizophrenia, affective disorders, and anxiety disorders. So that's why we develop these time-space experience scales now and also self-scales for differential diagnostic as a pure first experiential phenomenological marker. And then correspondingly, as you see, we also develop various temporal and spatial measures on the side of the brain. Yeah, temporal dynamic, temporal imprecision, schizophrenia, various active speed measures for depression relevant and so on and so forth. So that's why we say, that maybe as scientifically and novel and strange as it sounds, this may have uh, a strong differential diagnostic slash clinical value. And as I said, the results of our studies confirm that. So the idea is now basically after we have all the smaller samples that maybe running these kind of tests, different test batteries, the psychological, the behavioral, the neuronal, uh, in a larger clinical sample and basically using it only for clinical uh, purposes. Last thing, it has deep implications for therapy. Because what I like is spatial temporal therapy. So I indicated already the occipital TMS, I indicated the motor cortex TMS. This is basically another set of studies which could be really run in a larger clinical study according to the uh, psychological behavioral neuronal profiling of motor cortex. Uh, 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 visual cortex and DLPFC, we can then say, okay, you said these are the targets for TMS, and we can, of course, also tailor, individualize the frequency. That is precision-based medicine. Another thing which is ongoing uh, currently here in Ottawa is that we do breathing therapy. Why breathing therapy? Because uh, when you see, you know this in anxiety patients, they have fast breathing, they have racing thoughts, and they have very arrhythmic, yeah, they're very uh, ir irregular in their breathing pattern, in their uh, anxiety, and of course that causes uncertainty, and of course you become anxious if you have too much uncertainty. So now we try usually, uh, we individualize the, the, the breathing protocol on a psychological level and also on the EEG level, and what we see is this is the uh, 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 tr uh, first 12 patients, you really see a reduction in the anxiety after three weeks, T2 is uh, three weeks, this is before uh, breathing therapy. They have to do the breathing uh, morning and evening, 10 minutes with an individualized protocol in an app, which we uh, provide them uh, for home. And we can really see a, a good uh, reduction in the anxiety here, particularly T1, T2. And this also holds for each individual subject. It's, it's amazing. I um, mean, and you know, you do usually have huge inter individual variability. And interestingly, we also included a mind wandering scale, very short mind wandering for deliberate and spontaneous thought. Here's a spontaneous thought. You see again, quite a good decrease. And again, as I said, it holds across all individuals, uh, particularly these two measures. And we have some other scale, and we also do EEG in them. So with that, I come to the end. Uh, I hope I showed you, I made a case for spatial temporal psychopathology. It's a novel approach that connects brain and symptoms. And I hope that that can also be used for clinical diagnosis and therapy. Thank you very much.